Patriotic Sunday here at Franklin Road Baptist Church. We are so thankful that you are here. You are our honored guest. And if you are a guest here with us, of course, we're doing things just a little bit differently. And uh, our pastor is actually here this morning, recovering from that knee surgery. And uh, we're thankful to have him in service. This hasn't been here, been, uh, been online, actually. But uh, you are our honored guest. If you're here with us, we'd love for you to stop out in the lobby. And I believe we'll have a little something for you. Uh, to take with you just to remember us by. Would you say it with me? America, America, God shed his grace on me. Let's sing, oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Oh. single soldier who has ever fought for our freedom, whether they gave the full sacrifice of their life or just the time and effort that it took to be a soldier and to be in those situations. They are heroes. They truly are heroes. We want to honor them that way today. Let's think of them as we sing this third verse. Oh, Pledge of Allegiance by Brother Dan Alcorn, and we will address this flag uh, to my right and over to your left. All right, attention, salute, and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You'll remain standing. We will will address the same flag. And let's bow our heads for prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we do thank you for every day that you give us to live. It's only by your mercy and grace that you give us another day. And Lord, as we celebrate our country today, we think of all that's going on in our country. But Lord, you're still on the throne. So we ask for your guidance, your direction. Help us to be the Christians that we should be on this earth. Be a witness to others. Lord, there is hope in this life. Thank you, Father, for dying on that cross and shedding your blood for us and giving us a wonderful gift of eternal life. 
and Lord, the peace that you give in our heart. Thank you, Father. We ask your blessings now upon the services in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's a very special time in our service. We do this every single year. Of course, it'll be just a little bit different, uh, but we are going to sing, the choir's gonna sing each of the branches fight songs. And when you hear of the four main branches, your, your fight song, we'd like you to come up here. Now, normally we would have you come uh, onto the platform, place of honor, but we still wanna honor you, but we're gonna use the main floor right here because of social distancing. We took out some chairs. And we wanted you to be able to feel comfortable coming up here, but we wanna honor you veterans for your service. So when you hear your Branches fight song, we invite you to come up here. We want to honor you in that way.
Our pastor says this every single year, and we didn't want to miss out on saying this again. Only two people have ever offered to die for you. The American soldier, who we have standing in front of us now, and Jesus Christ. One died for your freedom. The other died for your soul. John chapter 15, verse 13 says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And even though these right here did not give their lives in the ultimate sacrifice, they still gave their lives, their time, their effort, their blood, sweat, and tears. Let's thank them one more time. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. You may go back to your seats, veterans, and we certainly appreciate that. The rest of us, let's sing together the old rugged cross. We mentioned just a moment ago that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the ultimate sacrifice on that cross. And we'd like to sing that first verse. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Let's think about Jesus' sacrifice. On a
We're privileged today to have some of the widows of those that were pictured here just a moment ago. And if you are here this morning and uh, your spouse was pictured up there on those pictures, would you stand at your place? We'd like to honor you. Our staff members have a, a rose and they would like to put that in your hands and uh, thank you for the support uh, that you gave to your, your spouse for all those many years, uh, especially during the time that they served our country. Let's give these ladies a good hand. In the first service, Joseph Schumann was actually the one leading the pledge and praying as Brother Dan did this morning. And as he prayed, he, he thanked God for, or, or he, he asked for encouragement for the spouses of those uh, veterans, especially those who had given their lives uh, in, in combat. And that's just something that struck me. And I thought I would pass it along to you as, as the, those in the 11 o'clock service. But sometimes we don't think of those family members. Sometimes we just think of the soldiers and we're grateful for their sacrifice. Sometimes we pass right over those family members. Let's be an encouragement to those folks uh, today as we, as we honor our country, as we honor our veterans, but as we see them around. Uh, as we move into the next section of our service, I want you to think about our country and where we are right now. Um, you know, uh, no matter what, where you are in your political leanings, we know that our country is divided. And we know that the answer to that division is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you would, watch this next video and the next few things during the service and think with a spiritual heart about what we can do as a, as a church and as Christians individually to make a difference in our country for God.
only under God. Our church theme this year is the idea of revival. Taken from Psalm 85, 6, wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. There's nothing to rejoice in if we don't have God involved in our lives, truly, because there's confusion, there is uh, lack of direction, lack of guidance, and lack of blessing from God. But if we'll turn to God, if we will be under God and let him work in our hearts, then he'll do something special in our land. Would you stand with me? And let's sing about that revival. Revive us again, we praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. Lift it up together. We praise thee. God for thy spirit of light. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, like the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, like the glory. Revive us. Sing it on verse. a special in the preaching of the word of God. I just wanted to say that we're privileged to have Pastor Mike Creed from the Independent Baptist Church up in Clinton, Maryland. He is the director of Awake America Ministries, which runs what's called Capital Connection. Um, and it's uh, a tremendous outreach into the Capitol Hill area for our representatives, our congressmen, our senators. And um, we'll, uh, we'll have a video to introduce him here in just a moment, kind of introduce you to his ministry if you're not aware of it. Many of us are, uh, but to let you know about that, and then immediately after that, we'll have the special, the video, and then he will come and preach for us this morning.
Excited about our Capital Connection this year with over 40 states represented. Corey Bain, West Virginia. Mike Kleitz, Indiana. Tim Rabin, North Carolina. Danny Lamont, Tennessee. Jason Baxter, Maryland. Aaron Richard from North Pole, Alaska. Caleb Fulman, Pennsylvania. Jason Walker, Colorado. Brian Robinson, Iowa. California. Illinois. New York. Georgia. Virginia. Ohio. Pastor Dave Volker, New Jersey. I still believe that the only hope we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But America is not under attack because it's evil. America is under attack because it stands for good. It stands for righteousness. And the hope of America is God's people with God's power. Of course, we're right here at the heartbeat of our government, and as such, we have an opportunity to go in with these men and women who serve our nation on a daily basis to be able to pray with them. This year's presentation that was literally given to every office in the House and in the Congress, 535 offices, as we prayed with the leaders. It's called Contemplations of Moral and Divine. Its author is literally Matthew Hale, 1685. It came across the ocean and went into the home of George Washington, where George Washington's mother did their daily devotions out of this book. Well, amen. It's great to be with you today. And uh, we're excited. I don't know if you saw that one representative hug, Brad Wells. He gave him a real good hug. Uh, they grew up together on farms next to each other. That man farmed the farm next to Brad Wells. When Brad Wells and his family went to New Guinea, 
they actually farmed their farm and leased it out and took care of their farm while they were, they started 11 works in New Guinea, Brother Brad Wells. And uh, so that's why they, they hugged. They uh, just have grown up as friends and God used them in a great way. God has blessed us at Awake America. I want to thank your pastor for allowing us to come. I want to thank you for your kindness and uh, all that you've done for us. Uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, your pastor asked me if I wanted to fly, and, and I decided to fly in my car, okay? Uh, it, it, you know, if you're going to get away as a pastor, one of the only ways you can get away with your wife is get in your car and drive somewhere. And so uh, we drove, and we drove hours and stopped in Johnson City and had the privilege to come here and it has really been a blessing uh, to be here at the ministry. Thank God for ministries that had just keep on going. When the time is tough, they just keep on going for the Lord. Amen? And uh, I, I've challenged our church. I've challenged our people at Independent Baptist Church. Let's not stop. In these times of difficulty, let's move forward for the Lord. And I've challenged them to accomplish some things and We've done much, even during this coronavirus, God has, has blessed. We had a family join last week, was one of our first big services. So we've had small services, uh, but uh, last week we had a good-sized service, and so we started Sunday school and had a family join last week. We have people to be baptized. We're just excited about what God is doing at Independent Baptist Church. I pastor right outside of Washington, D.C., uh, right by Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, there in Maryland. We're about 11 miles from the White House as the crow flies. Now, I have some good news for you. Washington, D.C. is still intact. Now, I don't care what the media says. The media is telling you all kinds of things. They're saying the city's burning down and everything's just being destroyed. That is not the case. You say, how do you know, Pastor Creed? Because on Wednesday, we, or on Tuesday, we did a podcast. And after the podcast, I asked my chicken... These young staff guys, Brother Norris, they are chicken livers, man. I, I, I said, guys, you're going to go down to the White House with me. And they said, we're not getting killed. And I said, you're not going to get killed. Just, you know, just be a man. And, uh, and so uh, my two chicken livers drove back out of town, you know, three, three of them, I'm sorry. And uh, I decided I'd go. I called the White House, and I, I called a friend of mine, and I said, could you tell me whether it's safe to go to Lafayette Park today? And he said, Pastor Creed, I would advise you to pray. And then if God leads you, you go ahead and go down there. If he doesn't, if God doesn't lead you to go down there, I wouldn't go in there. And uh, I just, I, I decided I wanted to see what was taking place down there, not do any crazy things. And so I parked on New York Avenue, about two blocks from the White House, walked over to the White House, the, uh, the southeast gate, and everything was just as normal as could be, birds chirping, flowers blooming, everything was great. I, I walked up past the old executive building to Pennsylvania Avenue, and then I saw it start seeing some police cars. I walked across the street, and there were some windows boarded up. Everything is boarded up right around that sector, right around the White House. If you go out two blocks, if you go out a block and a half, you wouldn't even know that anything is happening in Washington, D.C., uh, the media would make you think that the city is burning down. It is not the case. I walked up the, I walked three blocks up because I couldn't get over to Lafayette Park, and I took a right and then went over and and I got to that uh, the street where where it leads into Lafayette Park, and uh, and I just began to spend some time with the police officers and uh, just walked past them. There were about a hundred of them in a line. Uh, blocking that. They were uh, in Lafayette Park. They had heavy equipment in there. They're cleaning everything up. And uh, I think they're through with it, all that mess down there now. And uh, they've cleaned everything up. And uh, I just went from man to man and thanked them for their service and thanked them for helping. And uh, while I was there, this little lady walks up to me and she goes, Sir, uh, and she, after I started thanking the policeman, she was walking beside me. And she was saying, thank you, thank you, you know, and, and we got about halfway across. She said, would you take my picture? So we, if you can imagine, you're looking at Lafayette Park, the statue, and then the White House. And, and uh, I said, sure, I'll take your picture. And, and, uh, and uh, I got her, her phone backed up and had the policeman focused in, the statue and all in the White House. She pulled out her Make America Great Again hat. Put that thing on. She goes, okay, take my picture. All of a sudden, this cussing starts happening. 
megaphone goes off, everybody looking, I, I, they were breathing down my neck, man. I'm, I'm, I thanked everybody and got out of that place and uh, let, left that lady with her make, make America Great hat. It was a pink hat, okay? Make America Great hat, and uh, I got out of there. But uh, I, I want to tell you, uh, the media is making it look like our country is burning down. They are the minority. We are the majority. And uh, let me say, and, and I'm not talking about race. I'm talking about that crowd that hates America. Now, uh, let me say this. There's 80 million saved or evangelicals in America. There were only 30 million of them that voted in the last election. There's 50 million that have not voted, and 25 million of those, according to Barna, have not even registered to vote. If you, sit in the, if you sit in this auditorium this morning and you haven't registered to vote, you need to, you need to go out and fill out the paperwork. And you say, everything's good in Tennessee. Hey, you need to vote. Yeah. You need to, to take care of your responsibility as an American. And you need to vote. I'm going to register. I'm going to register voters in our church. We are, we're having a registration next week. Uh, Lord willing, if we can get the paperwork, everything's closed down there. But we're, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to Ohio, brother. We're going to Wisconsin next week. We're going to Ohio for the three cities there. We're going to uh, Pennsylvania. And we're meeting with pastor groups of 50 and feeding them and, and just helping them learn how to register voters in their church. We don't tell anybody how to vote, but we do register voters. And let me say this. I don't tell them who to vote for, but we need to vote biblical values. We need to vote biblical values. They say, what, what do you mean? I have some information we're going to share with you after the service. I have a table out there. Now, I want to get you this information. It shares what I'm talking about this morning. I'd like to encourage you. God has blessed America. God has blessed our country, folks. I don't care what, what people are saying. I don't care about the crowd that's paid to go protest in front of every camera in America. God has blessed America. God has blessed this Murfreesboro area. I, I, you guys, they're building everywhere. I, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, it's not bad here. I could live here. Are you looking for an assistant pastor? Okay, always. Okay. Uh, I, I could live here. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I... I went out to that, uh, uh, I went out and got some barbecue yesterday, and my, man, the Lord set my soul on fire, amen? Uh, that brisket and that, uh, that smoky sauce just, just blessed my soul. Uh, if you'll turn your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 33, Psalm chapter 33, God has blessed awake America. Uh, we've had the privilege to uh, just spend some time on Capitol Hill. God's given us an office right behind the Supreme Court. And God has given us a ministry to go in and uh, just minister to leaders. And l let me say this, uh, many times I go in to minister to leaders and they minister to me. There's a lot of saved leaders on Capitol Hill. Uh, the media will not talk about them, but there are folks that are leading other leaders to Lord. There are folks that are discipling. I know one man that leads people to the Lord, he disciples them, he gives them a Bible. Uh, and just a godly individual. There's an independent Baptist pastor's son, Mark Walker from North Carolina, that I spend a lot of time with and uh, just enjoy um, ministering to him. There are folks from all over the country that know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And we need to, we need to lift our leaders' arms. And these days, there are difficult times. Uh, pastor, what is the temperature down there? Honestly, I've talked to fellas. I've spent time. I've, I've called in. Uh, I spent a lot of time pushing uh, that church is essential in the White House. Uh, we, we, did a, uh, we did a petition, uh, actually wrote a letter to the, the vice president and uh, had it hand delivered to him. And, and uh, God has really blessed. Folks, uh, I don't think we've ever had a president like we have. Well, I, I know we haven't had a president like we have right now. But honestly, that has taken the side of believers like he has and defended churches. You may not like him, but folks, when you see what he has done for churches and Christians and believers, uh, it has been a blessing. It's been a breath of fresh air on Capitol Hill. And if you deal with those people, you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, he has taken a stand. Now, in Psalm, 
uh, chapter 33, Psalm chapter 33 this morning, a very familiar portion of Scripture in verse 12. Could we stand this morning as we read this verse? And I'm, I want to have you read it together with me. Uh, 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 Psalm 33, Psalm 33, and if you look at verse 12, ready, let's read together. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Love that first phrase. The psalmist David, this is a psalm of David. It is a psalm of praise. And, and then it not only talks about uh, the praise that we ought to give to our great God, verses 1 through 3, but he goes down through this chapter and tells why we ought to give praise. And then he, uh, uh, it's kind of like a sandwich message. The last uh, thought is how we ought to be committed to praise our God. Folks, if there's anybody that can praise God in this day, it is the United States of America. God has blessed us in a great way. And God will continue to bless us if we, in turn, will serve him. Now, we're going to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to share uh, just a thought with you this morning about Mer America and how God has blessed the blessings of God upon America. I want to just share four thoughts with you, and we'll let you go. But, uh, boy, I'm blessed I am blessed by the red, white, and blue here. I'm blessed by all the soldiers. And boy, I tell you what, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your sacrifice. And, uh, and, and a church with a heartbeat for America. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have to come to this place. God, I pray that you'll stir hearts this morning as we just look at your hand upon America, your blessings. I pray that it'll be vivid to us uh, that uh, there is a God that uh, has placed our country here. And for such a time as this, Christians need to stand and be counted in this day. God, thank you for your blessings of America. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Years ago, uh, 10 men came to, came to Washington, D.C. Um, Brother Gibbs uh, had set this thing up, and there were fellows from all over the country. They came into, uh, into D.C. I got invited to the meeting. I didn't, I didn't know. I had always wanted... Brother Norris, I had always wanted to be involved with Capitol Hill, but I didn't know how to do it. There is no manual on how to be involved with Capitol Hill. You just go in and you step on landmines. That's just the way it is. If you make a mistake, you have to beg them forgiveness. And I have eaten crow, okay? Uh, but uh, I understand this. I, these men came, and as they came, they, uh, before they had come, I had prayed that God would allow me to have that privilege to work on Capitol Hill. I, I prayed about it. Uh, but it never happened. One night, I was putting my tie on Wednesday night, and my wife was sitting there. We were listening to the radio, and she goes, you need to do something about that. And I said, what would you say, woman? And she said, you need to do something about that. And I said, Valerie, and she, by the way, she's here somewhere. And uh, I said, Valerie, who do you think I am? I'm just a preacher. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to deal with these guys. I'd like to go down there. I'd love to be a park. But I don't know, I've grown up here since sixth grade, and you're telling me to go down there and do something. She said, well, back in the old days when the preachers had some fire in their bellies, they probably would have gone down there and done something. I said, I hear you loud and clear, Valerie. I hear what you're saying. Uh, she was a colonel's daughter. Uh, in the, he was in uh, Air Force uh, with Systems Command, and, and she shared that with me, a wonderful encouragement for Wednesday night. And... Uh, I went away from that and was invited to the meeting. We went down and met with uh, uh, former Attorney General John Ashcroft. He's a saved man. Uh, his office is above a church uh, right there in the middle of Washington, D.C., very pivotal in history. He has a kind of a glass atrium, and you look down over that. And we sat in his office, and he said, fellas, uh, before we uh, talk, he said, we have to ramp up. And I'm like, ramp up? What in the world does that mean? He said, we need to read. Uh, we need to argue. He said, I couldn't find a word, a good word, so I used argue. He said, uh, a word, but he said, I never argue with the Bible. He said, we ask questions. And he said, then we need to meditate and we need to pray. And so we took a half hour and we ramped up. And uh, it was a wonderful time. This pastor sat there. And then finally, after all that, he said, it's wonderful to send missionaries around the world. And he said, we should. He said, it's wonderful to plant churches. He said, my father was an evangelist. And he said, we've been a part of planting churches. And he said, and we should. But he said, Capitol Hill has a void. It is a vacuum. And he said, if somebody does not fill the vacuum, it will get filled by the wrong people. 
And so we sat there and we all pondered that and we chewed on it. We left. We began to go through and meet leaders and walk on the hill. And, and I'll never forget, they were, we were sitting at a dinner table and they were all smiling at me. And I'm like, guys, what, what's your problem? And they said, you're the closest one here. You need to do this. And uh, I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. They said, we'll set you up. So they set me up in a meeting with John Boehner and, and it was a, all the, a bunch of leaders from the Hill. And then Mike Pence was in the meeting and, uh, and we stood up and just literally said to them, hey, we're here for the Independent Baptist. Uh, uh, there, and we told them how many uh, million independent, 2.3 million Independent Baptists uh, in, in America. And we said, we're here to represent them. You know, the Methodists are here and the Catholics are here and the whole crowd is here, but we're going to be here for the independent Baptists. And man, they stuck their heads up and started looking around. And John Boehner was sitting right here and he looked up and, you know, trying to figure out who we were. We walked out of the room on the way out of the Capitol building. I'll never forget uh, a lady named Jeannie stopped us. And she said, my name is Jeannie. Uh, who are you guys? And I said, well, Jeannie, um, who are you? And she said, well, I just caused trouble on Capitol Hill. And I said, you caused trouble? She goes, I'm a lobbyist. And she said, I, I just caused trouble here. And I said, well, does your husband work here? And she said, yeah, he works across the street. And I said, well, what's his name? She said, Clarence. And I said, Clarence Thomas. I said, I think I know who he is. And you're not married to Clarence Thomas. And she said, yes, I am. And I said, no, you aren't. And she said, go to lunch with me and we'll talk. And we went and met with Eric Cantor. He was the leader of that day. And, uh, and, and with Jeannie Thomas. And she said, what can I do to help you all get involved on the Hill? And I just said, could you make me a short list of 10 people that I should start with and open the door for me to get in the offices? And she sent me this list like a teenager. It looked like a teenager's you know, email, real funky font. I mean, something that I'd, I thought I'd get, you know, something with the Supreme Court, you know, on it or something like that, you know. And here it is, this funky font with a number of names. And so I said, I'm just going to try it out, Valerie. I'm going down there. I walked in the first office, Steve King. He was number one on the list, Iowa. And I said, Mr. King. Uh, I said to the secretary, uh, Jeannie Thomas sent me here and said that I, I ought to meet with Mr. King. He ought to be one of my, my first visits. And I had been getting, you know, come back the second Tuesday of next year, okay? Uh, and, uh, and I walked in and I said, Jeannie Thomas. And, and he said, they said, can you wait just a couple minutes? He'll be available for you in just a few minutes. It's been a half hour. It went on with John Boehner. It went on with a number of leaders all over the hill. And God has established a, 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 just an opportunity for us to minister down on Capitol Hill. My church has uh, used it, uh, I use it as a soul winning opportunity, an opportunity to be a blessing to leaders that are away from their homes and just work with them. But I can say this morning that God has blessed America. God has blessed America. Uh, uh, turn the TVs off, you'll be fine. Turn the news off, you'll be fine. Uh, turn the, turn the, you know, turn, turn this, uh, you know, this, uh, all this uh, news and all these, uh, all these different opinions off, and you'll be fine. Understand this: there's a God in heaven that knows all about the United States of America. Now, in this portion of Scripture, he says, "Blessed or happy is the nation whose God is the Lord," and I, I love it. He comes and he says we ought to praise God. He tells us what we should praise God about. And then he makes, he says, make a commitment to praise God uh, for what he has done for you. In our nation, we ought to look back and say this, thank God for what he has done in the United States of America. I want to leave, I want to leave the same type of nation for my grandchildren that I've grown up in. I want to leave that kind of nation. And uh, I... I have had folks in my family, I have, I have folks in the military in our church that have given their time and their effort and their lives uh, for America. May we understand this, God has blessed America. Four ways that I want to share with you this morning. And you think about this, in the midst of global struggles, God allowed a country to be planted uh, in the midst of the world based on God's liberty and based on God's law. You, you think about this, of all the nations, and I, 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 we're building fences and doing crazy things. You know, we're, we're doing all kinds of things to defend our nation, 
But you think about it, people all over the world would love to live where you live. Amen. Would love to I'd go to another nation, Brother Norris. I, I'll go and I'll fly back in. And when I get back, I, you know, I kind of think my area is a little bit tough. And I get back and I want to kiss the ground right in my town. Uh, I, I, I get back and, and I want to hug people and say thank you for what you're doing. And I, walk, I, I go down Washington, D.C. and see the freedom that we have as a nation. And folks, we are truly blessed this morning in our churches. We have freedom today to meet, to preach the truth of the Word of God. May we really understand the blessings of our nation. Now, what are they? Number one, I want you to understand the blessing uh, 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 America was founded on God's word and on biblical principles of truth. I, I, you know, I, my, my wife and I, when we were writing one of our first books, The Prayers That Shape America, uh, along with Brother Chuck Harding, we, we shared this phrase, we, we shared the thought about the prayers that shaped America. And a lot of times we read the history books. Folks, I, I would challenge you, take some time with your children and, and go back to the history of our nation. If you don't know about the history, if you, don't, if you, if you flunked civics class, uh, go back and start working on it again. Amen? But I, I understand this this morning as I looked at this. Our nation was founded on God's Word. It was founded on biblical principles. There was a group of people in Europe, and they couldn't find uh, a presence. Uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, a, a dominating religious group, and everywhere they went, they could not find peace. And so they got on a ship that was less than the size of a volleyball court. 120 of them came across the ocean, they had a place they were gone and ended up in another place. And here we find they landed, but it was all about God's word. It was about God's truth. It was about what we are doing this morning. Now let me say, as I read this uh, of Plymouth Plantation, I'd recommend you read Williams Bradford's Plymouth Plantation. It says, lastly, and uh, which was not le uh, least, a great hope, an inward zeal uh, they had of laying some good foundation. These people that came across, uh, this 120 people that came across, they, had a, they wanted to lay a foundation as they came across. Listen to this. Or at least make some way thereunto for the propagating and the advancing of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be but even stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great work. They came to a place and they, they said, we don't have religious freedom, but uh, we can go across to a remote place and we can preach the gospel and we can build a foundation and we can, uh, we can help them to understand the truth of the gospel. And we find in our day, folks, we have a we have a country that was founded on the Word of God. Only one other country like that is in Israel. And we have been founded on the truth of the Word of God. May we understand the blessing of that. I've been to countries. I, I went to Romania right after the wall went down. They killed Ceausescu and his wife in front of, on Channel 1 of Romanian TV. I think that's all the channels they had. And they caught him and they put him before a firing squad. And I went over there and as I went over there, everywhere I went to preach the truth of the, of the Word of God, they were hungry. The, the, the houses were filled. The women on one side, men on the others. Uh, I, I, even I went to a wedding and they were, had their heads in the windows of the wedding. And everywhere I went, uh, we would stop. And five times a day on Sunday, we would preach the Word of God. And there was a hunger for the Word of God. And may America realize the blessing that we have today of, of being founded on the truth of the Word of God. These pilgrims, they... They prepared for this voyage to America. Uh, it says this, by a, a day of solemn humiliation. Uh, in the text, Ezra 8 and verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Hava uh, that uh, we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek uh, of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our substance, these pilgrims stopped and they prayed over this portion of Scripture. God, help us in our endeavor as we, we seek to, to move and carry out your word and pray for our families and pray for our substance. We're giving it all. 
that we might proclaim the Word of God. And they came to America. And they, uh, as they landed on America, a hundred of them, uh, there they landed at that place. A, a terrible winter ensued. I can't imagine. I've, I've often just read the book and just tried to sit there and ponder what they went through. Uh, if you can understand the terrible winters they have up in New England. And here they are, a hundred people. They land, don't have enough time to get their places built and everything. And, and over 50% of them died. They actually took the people that had died and they dug graves and they uh, put these people in these graves and buried them and they actually planted corn over them so that the savage, you know, the Indians wouldn't uh, come to a place where they dug them up or know that uh, they had had that many die and come in and destroy what they were doing. And, and we understand 50% of them. And then Bradford, we find William uh, Brewster and John Robinson and, and, and William Bradford led uh, these pilgrims. And it says this, the first winter, a hundred uh, of a hundred, only 50 survived. In Bradford's diary, it said there were but six or seven sound persons to meet the needs of those alive. In other words, they were sick and, and there were like six or seven folks that had their right mind uh, and, and were tending to these folks and trying to help them just to make it through the winter and they gave their lives. What a blessing. Folks come because of their religious beliefs, because they believed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They came to our country and, and founded our country. I, I, I took a glance at what they really did. And you say, Pastor, what did the, the pilgrims do for us? We understand this. They gave us a glance of Christian character. Boy, I tell you, it takes character to do something like they did, bringing their families across. Uh, they, gave us a, they gave us a picture of God's will and folks that wanted to follow God's will. They gave us a, a, a view of God's supernatural care and how God cared for them in this time. And they, they gave us a picture of the freedom of, of, uh, of worship and applying God's word to civil society. And folks, we need to thank God that we can carry the Word of God. I, I, I go to my office in my house and I have Bibles lined up. What a privilege to have a Bible. And being in Europe in a place where it was closed in Romania, as I handed a Bible to a little lady, uh, she clutched it on her chest and ran away and I never saw her again. But it was precious to her. May God's Word be precious to us in this day. God blessed America that we were founded on the Word of God. Amen? I noticed the second thing. They, God blessed America because he gave us the promise of unalienable rights. Say that five times in a row, okay? Uh, unalienable rights. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? It means that our rights are not transferable. Aren't you glad you have rights that are not transferable? It, it, it has this thought, unable to be taken away. And then it says this in the Declaration of Independence, that the rights that we have been given, they are unalienable, but they were, they were endowed by their creator. In other words, they were given to us by God. The red, white, and blue, we are in a special place. Uh, constitutions come and go in other nations. Uh, governments come and go in other nations. We are, you think about it, we're getting ready to celebrate the birthday of our nation. It's only 244 years old. You, you think about that. It's not very old, and, and we look at it, we're getting ready to celebrate that part. Uh, I'm glad that we have had people that would stand up and sound the word that cared about our nation, that cared about speaking to lawmakers. There was a man named John Leland. He was a Baptist preacher. I, you might want to just write, uh, Google his name, if you use Google, whatever you use. Uh, Google uh, his name, John Leland. I... I was driving, and uh, me and my wife, I told you, we zoomed down here, amen, and, uh, and we took the back way, and we came down the Constitution Highway in Virginia. It's a beautiful place. If you ever have the opportunity, you come from Fredericksburg, and, and then you turn on the Constitution Highway and go through Orange, Virginia. Has anybody ever been there? Uh, anybody ever been on that uh, Constitution Highway? Anybody? Okay, there's one back here. And I, I said, Valerie, there's a stone. There is a place. Let's look for it. And we're driving and driving. I could not find it. And then all of a sudden, I passed it. And I said, there it is. And we did a U-turn, went back. And there is a stone for John Leland. He met James Madison walking on that road from Fredericksburg 
uh, from Orange uh, to Fredericksburg, the Constitutional Highway, and he stopped him and he said this, I want to just know if you're going to if you're going to handle biblical rights, biblical freedom. He said, there are men in jail for preaching the word of God. And he said, I want to know if you're going to uh, give us freedom as preachers to preach the word of God. And uh, Madison uh, heard him say, uh, speaking, and he was kind of a Baptist preacher that would kind of say what he felt, you know. And, uh, and Leland said this, because if you don't, I'm going to run and I'm going to get biblical values uh, placed in our Constitution. Well, Madison said this, I promise you, uh, I will put religious freedom in the Constitution. Of course, they voted him in. Uh, he is the father of the Constitution, and we have that, that uh, First Amendment, that religious freedom. You think about it, because a Baptist preacher was willing to stop and take some time to talk to a leader. He, we have that religious freedom, freedom of speech and freedom of press today because somebody cared about, uh, uh, you know, cared about the, the, the leaders. We find, we find that we have these unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the thinking about life today, uh, in our country, they want to destroy life with abortion. You think about this, they want to take away liberty. That, there's a group that wants anarchy in our country. I can't imagine there is a person that just got on the news and just said this, I'm, if, if people don't listen, I'm going to burn down the country. Did you hear it? I'm just going to burn down the country. And, and I look at that and I say, how in the world can that happen? But folks, the voice of America needs to rise up. Amen. Americans need to stand up. And they need to voice their opinion. Thank God for the red, white, and blue. And thank God, thank God for the promises of unalienable rights. Folks, uh, America has been founded on, a pow on powerful documents, powerful structure, and powerful laws. And we are blessed today that you can go and, and you can read those laws and find out that we, the people, are the bosses. Well, it's quiet here today. It's quiet. But that's how it is in America. Christians are afraid. I, was, I told the other crowd this morning, I heard a testimony of a lady. Her daughter called her from Wisconsin. And, and she was a nurse. And she said, I just want to tell you, Mom, she said, I, me and my friends that are nurses working in this place, we're afraid to vote the right way because we're afraid for what will happen to us if we do. And they find out. Can you imagine in America being afraid to vote the right way because you're afraid of bodily harm? You know, I've seen in other countries where they have their purple thumbs, where they take that thumbprint and we're just going in to vote. They could lose their life for voting. And yet in America, may it never be said that we stop and we don't vote. We don't take the time to honor what God has given us. If, you're not, if you are not registered to vote, you ought to go out this week and register to vote uh, and get, uh, get your name on the, on, on the till. Get out there and let your voice be heard. We find this. America promises unalienable rights. Number three, I wrote this. America has, has been a gift to the world. You say, Pastor, what in, the, what in the world do you mean, a gift of the world? It is amazing what God has done to use our nation to reach the world. You say, Pastor, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what you're saying. There are missionaries that have gone all over the world and, and preached the gospel to all the different nations. I began to uh, read, and when I, when I began to read about this gift, uh, I realized uh, they, there was what was called the First Day Society. Uh, America's first Sunday school program was birthed December 19th, 1790. A lot of preachers got mad about Sunday school. They, didn't want, they were mad that we were having Sunday school, but then when they realized that it was preaching the truth of the Word of God and discipling a nation, they realized it was starting with the children uh, that we understand everybody started having Sunday school. You say, who in the world uh, was it that pushed that? There was a man, uh, a godly man named Benjamin Rush, Dr. Benjamin Rush. 
Uh, I challenge you to read his books and understand a man that was saved by the grace of God and was unashamed uh, to preach the gospel. Uh, Francis Scott Key and a man named Matthew Carey were all involved in starting Sunday school. A Bible society was officially organized December 12th, 1808. The Bible Society of Philadelphia for the distribution of God's Word. Dr. William White, President. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Vice President. There were days of proclamations of thanksgiving and humility when uh, things would happen in our nation like what is happening right now. The President would call for everybody to take a day off and to pray and seek God's face. We understand that happened. It began with George Washington and also uh, with uh, President Adams, John Adams. The Philadelphia Bible Society concluded a report by declaring it not only the object of their prayers, but their hopes that before the present generation shall have passed away, the Holy Scriptures will be read by all the principal nations under heaven, and thus uh, that the, uh, we may be opened uh, for the fulfillment of the prediction of the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We understand this. Our nation was founded and has been a gift to the world. You say, Pastor, we've caused a lot of problems. We've saved a lot of nations. We've gone in when the troubles were there. Uh, we've taken the word of God in. Boy, I, uh, I, I, uh, I know people, missionaries in the Philippines, and we have missionaries that have gone to the Philippines, and now uh, the, the Philippines are sending out missionaries all over the world and sending uh, folks out. And folks, you say, where did, it, where did it begin? And we find that God planted a nation built on the word of God and uh, 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 in order and, and uh, with love laws and structure and now we've had the opportunity to get the word of God out and, and to uh, proclaim the, uh, the word of God. The first time uh, we went to Capitol Hill we, we delivered a Bible. It's called the Aiken Bible. There's only 30 of them left. George Washington had given the Continental Army, uh, uh, he was uh, Continental Congress permission to print it. There was a man in uh, in Philadelphia named Aiken and he printed these Bibles. They didn't print a lot of them but he printed those Bibles and he sent those Bibles out there, King James Bible, without King James in it because they didn't like King James at that time. But they printed those Bibles and they sent them all over our nation that the people might know the truth of the Word of God. We understand today that God has blessed and he has made our nation a gift. Uh, I, I look at this nation and I see all that God is doing and what a blessing uh, God has, ha, has given us here in our nation. And uh, folks, you get up any time of the night and you go and get, get a gallon of milk. I don't know if you have 7-Eleven here. You might have Golden Gallon or whatever it is. I don't know. You have all kinds of these stores. But we get up and we go and you go into the grocery stores and there's plenty. Uh, and and uh, we go and we buy what we want. I took my wife to a shoe store. I should have never done that yesterday. Uh, big mistake. Uh, she came out with two boxes and she said she got a really good deal. Amen, husbands? I know about those deals, okay? But uh, I understand this. We have a great country with great freedom and built on the word of God and the laws and the justice. May we thank God for the red, white, and blue today. Boy, we have the blessings. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Folks, uh, honestly, as far as the world's concerned, we don't have a lot of problems in our country. I mean, we have problems, but take a flight. Take a three-hour flight. Go and drop into some of those countries. Go into those sections where the little houses are like our sheds. They're little tin shanties. And the people are happy as can be. They come out, the little girls come out dressed in a, in a nice dress. And I said, how in the world can they get them dressed up like that coming out of that little tin shanty? And they love the word of God. And, and, and they just want, they, they look at Americans and they say, you are so blessed. How in the world, you know, how, how, how did you get so lucky to be born? And it's not luck. God placed a nation here. God has put us here for such a time as this. Thank God for his blessings. I wrote one more down. I wrote this thought down, America has passed on founding principles on which it was birthed 
through education. When I look at education, folks, uh, someone has said, and I, I've been asked over the years, what do you think the worst problem that we have is? And it's been education. We are sending our children to, to these, these major universities that have Woodstock professors teaching our children the wrong thing. And you say, Pastor, you know, how, how in the world can you say that? They, they have tenure. You can't get rid of them. And they're in these places, and, and uh, Georgetown University, I mean, a, a Jewish man goes in to speak in Georgetown University, and they're booed off the stage. A Palestinian comes in, and they, they give them a standing ovation. Uh, we, we live in a day where, where this, this country is going a different direction as far as education. But when you begin to study the beginning of education, and uh, education uh, is the key uh, uh, to our nation, uh, a nation's demise, uh, you, you, uh, we either are going to build and, and teach our children. Uh, if you notice today, they're tearing down statues trying to get rid of our history. And, uh, and some of those statues stand for some things that, that may not be the best thing. But folks, we can look back at history and see what we have corrected, what God has done. Uh, I still, and uh, uh, we just did a podcast on, on this racial thing and all that is taking place. And, and folks, in, in the church that I pastor, on a Sunday, we can have 23 nationalities. Uh, I, I love them. I mean, I've grown up with them. I've buried them. I've, I've prayed with them. We walked out of the Boston Globe, came to our church one time, and they said this, you know, you're kind of racially not, uh, you know, you can't mix in with this crowd very good. How in the world is it gone? And he wanted, they wanted me to give them bad news, that we hate each other and we're mad at each other. And I told them I love them. I go to their house. I bury them. I marry them. I, I, I feed them. I, I do everything I can. I counsel them, and I love them. You know, we're all from one blood, folks, according to Acts. And I came to understand this. Folks are looking for trouble. They're not looking for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a, a country that has, uh, you know, the education system has changed and things have happened. Harvard University, they had a motto. They, they, it, was, it was in their uh, founding papers, for Christ and the church. Let every student be plainly instructed and, and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and the study, uh, uh, the studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 3, or John 17 and verse 3. William and Mary said this, may, uh, may be furnished with a seminary of ministers of the gospel and the Christian faith uh, may be propagated to, this, to the glory of God, William and Mary. Princeton University, the first president, uh, uh, cursed, uh, uh, he says, cursed be all that learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. Uh, Jonathan Dickinson, Dickerson. We find that Rutgers University says, uh, has thought in their founding papers, preparing them for the ministry and other good offices. We find that Benjamin Franklin said a nation of well-informed men who have been taught uh, to know and prize the rights which God has given them cannot be enslaved. When I read that, I said, praise the Lord. If we'll teach people right, uh, and if our children know our history, they cannot be enslaved. Hey, we need to get busy, parents. We need to have some family meetings. We need to teach some truth. We need to teach some history. But he came and he said this, uh, they cannot be enslaved. He said, it is in the region of ignorance that tyranny begins. And we understand this, that uh, uh, God has given us a privilege. Man, I, I love sitting down with my grandchildren. And uh, I am a grandfather. I know I look like a teenager, but uh, I am a grandfather. And, and I've got five grandchildren, and God has blessed me uh, to sit down with them. And I, and I take time, and we talk about government things. I take them down to Capitol Hill. I walk them up to senators and let them shake their hands. And, and I said, this is a, you need to respect this man. He's, he's helping you. He's, he's making laws, and, and he's involved in, the, in, in, in this program. And, and I take them on tours of the Capitol and let them see the dome and, and and go through pictures and, and show, share with them the history of our country. May we thank God for the blessings that he has given us. But folks, this education system, we need to understand that uh, things are changing in this day. 
I wrote down uh, just some things. Dr. Lawrence A. Kremen, uh, in his study of American education from 1607 to 1789, credits the high quality of American education to the Bible, the single most important cultural influence in the lives of Anglo-Americans was the Word of God. They would read, they would learn to read from the Word of God. They would, they would study and, and learn things about uh, where they came from, from the Word of God. And may we take our children and, and educate them and, and, and start from a place like the Word of God. I, I love it. American education, it began in the home with parents. They saw it as their responsibility. It's still your responsibility, parents. We find that it was not the government's responsibility. They realized it was their responsibility. They found this truth in Deuteronomy 6. And many of you know the portion of Scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently. I love that. That means to repeat and, uh, and to uh, make sure that uh, they understand it. It says, teach, teach them diligently uh, unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest down in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Moses, talking to the children of Israel, he's about ready to, he's about ready to move, out, move out, and he says this, hey, don't forget God's Word. Don't forget teaching your children. And folks, what a great thing it is. But education is being slacked up. Uh, Fairfax, just, uh, Fairfax, Virginia just announced because of coronavirus, uh, this fall they'll either have two days of in-person teaching or you can go online uh, from home and get, uh, I think, three or four days of online teaching. But they're going to close down for the fall. Uh, our, our nation is being dumbed down by certain things, and folks, we cannot afford it. Our children need to know the truth. American a uh, education uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, the majority in the home as it began. And then, uh, Brother Norris, I found it very interesting. As I studied uh, American education, it, it moved from the home to the church. I'm glad we have schools, amen? Amen. I'm glad I have a Christian school. I'm glad I got to go to Christian school. My mom sacrificed. She did not, we didn't have the money. My dad wasn't making very much money there at Independent Baptist Church when he started pastoring. My mom began to babysit kids, and, and uh, she paid for our education. We were four kids in the home, and we all had the privilege to go through uh, some uh, Christian education. And, and uh, it, what a blessing it was. And then uh, my parents uh, said, You're, you need to go to college. I said, I just got done with school. You want me to go back? And, uh, you know, I stretched uh, four years into five years, and uh, I feel like I've been in, in, in school all my life. But I understand this. Boy, it was good for me. And I got the foundational principles, and God worked in my life. And in, in America, education, uh, you know, it moved from the home to the church and then some private sectors. And now the government has taken it and, boy, I tell you what, they have twisted it. And, and, and there are some good things happening, but there are some tragic things happening. If you go and hear some of the things that are being taught to kindergartners in these schools and lifestyles and all these things that should not be taught are being taught in our public uh, schools. And uh, uh, may we pray that God will bless America, but may we pray that uh, our education of our children in our churches is strong and not in a different direction as we've seen in this nation. Some of America's greatest leaders, thinkers, were primarily educated at home. I was shocked when I read this. George Washington was educated at home. Thomas Jefferson was educated at home. James Madison was educated at home. Benjamin Franklin, Noah Webster, you read his dictionary. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Edison, and Alexander G. Bell, uh, Bell. And we understand this. We, we grew as a nation and we had a wonderful education system. You think about, some of you probably read these, the New England Primer. Uh, the Webster's Dictionary, the McGuffey's Reader. Anybody ever read the McGuffey's Reader? And uh, the McGuffey's Readers, and then, and, and then you see Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Rutgers all began as Christian institutions, folks. They all began 
And, and we look at all this and you say, Pastor, what are you saying today? I'm saying this, God bless America. God has blessed our country. Here's my question and I'm finished. Will you bless God in this day? Will you bless the God of our country? I, I have some questions and, and I'll be finished. Will you support the pulpit and support it? May we have pulpits that are ablaze that preach the truth of the word of God. Will you support that? I, I ask you, you know, it's time for believers to pray fervently for their nation. Will you take five minutes and pray for your nation? We have a booklet that I'll give you out there that'll help you know how to pray for your nation. Have you ever thought about just five minutes a day, what it would, what it would take? And tonight I'm going to preach on prayer. I hope that you'll be here tonight, a pivotal portion of scripture. But uh, will, you, will you take time? Will you as a believer vote or get engaged to register voters? Will you, will you uh, continue to evangelize the lost? What a great church in a great place with great opportunities. And we have the opportunity here to be, to be a light in a dark world. But we need, we need to understand the blessings that God has given us. You think about it, 80 million evangelicals and only 30 million of them voted last election. 25 million weren't even registered. They said, I, I've been told on Capitol Hill, if, if 80 million Christians voted, we could name the president and win the election, every election. If Christians cared, we could literally name who would win the election. But some don't even darken the doors of the polls. We need to wake up in this day or we're going to lose the blessings that God has given us. Will you wake up? Awake America stands on several premises, and let me just share these real quickly. We believe that we need to educate concerning government, our rights, and folks, you need to educate your children in the same way. We believe that uh, we need to get engaged, motivate, and I love to get engaged and go down and talk to leaders on Capitol Hill. I love to challenge them, and I love to encourage them in these days. Uh, I love to be engaged. That We need to encourage legislation and we need to encourage the people of law. We need to entreat. The word entreat means we need to pray. And all of those first four, we do those so that we can, as a church, evangelize. If we'll keep our nation free, if we'll keep our pulpits hot, God will give us the privilege to send missionaries out around the world and to reach our communities and reach America for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a question. Do you really thank God for America? Have you thought about it? I love the red, white, and blue. I'm going to do this next week at our church. I love the red, white, and blue. I love to hear the national anthem that they're trying to get removed. I love it all. But do we really care about it? Today you might sit here and might not know that you don't know if, if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. If you sit here today and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, the Bible gives us God's plan for knowing for sure. Not that you might know, but we can know that we know we're going to heaven, according to the Bible. If you don't know that today, I would challenge you to step out on the first note of the invitation, come down. And there'll be somebody from, uh, from the church that'll show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Christians, we need to wake up in 2020. Every time we have an election, we say, this is going to be the, this is, this is the greatest election we've ever faced. It's, everyone's always the greatest. But folks, if we lose this election this year, we're going to lose a lot of freedoms. So I want to challenge you. We need to get engaged in these days. Get your eyes full of the blessings of God and understand how he has blessed America in this day. Let's pray. We'll be finished. Lord, thank you for the privilege to come here today. Thank you for this great church and this great host. Both services have been phenomenal crowds. And God, thank you that we can have the privilege to come into the church house today and that we can just enjoy America. I pray that you'll stir hearts to decision today. May we as Americans open our eyes and really see what you have given us in this day. Stir our hearts to serve you in a greater way, to be great citizens of this country. And God, I pray that you'll help us to get engaged 
and we're in these areas that you would have us to be engaged. And for that person that sits here today that does not know for sure they're going to heaven, may this be the day they trust you as personal Savior. So our hearts to decision. Wake us up to your will for our country now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand with heads back.